Asambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddham Dhammang Sanghang Namasami As we uh, finished the chanting and um, began the, the sitting this evening after this sort of um, very uh, stately, dignified Pali recitation of the, the fire sermon, the Adita Pariyaya Sutta, the, uh, strangely enough, the first thing that came into my mind at the, at the beginning of the sitting was... Saturday night at the movies. <laughs> I forget who sang it. <laughs> Saturday night at the movies. But, uh, here we are, Saturday evening. <laughs> who cares what picture you see? <laughs> I realize it was actually a very profound pop song. Yes, uh, probably many people don't remember it or know it. But um, Saturday evening, and uh, closing our eyes to meditate, and then uh, what? What do we see? And then there's the movies of yeah, who I think I am, what I like, what I don't like, what's good about my life, what's bad about it, yeah, who I who I like, who I dislike, um, what's right with the world, what's wrong with the world, what I want, what I've got, what I want to keep hold of. What I haven't got, I like to get hold of. Yada 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 yada. You know, this is our our world. You know, the the movies that we we see is this kind of array of of the inner realm, personality, the body, uh, our own stories, the outer stories, the beauties and the tragedies of the world around us, present, past, to come, comedies and tragedies, histories. This is like the, the whole array of, of movies. Saturday night at the movies. Settle down, just watch it all happening. And uh, you know, this, is, this is really what it's like. This is what I find it's, what it's like a lot of the time. And... Um, This is, uh, in a way, what Buddhist practice points us towards, is that um, sitting in the back row of the balcony, not really caring what movie it is. <laughs> 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 Hugging with your baby in the last row of the balcony. And uh, that, um, in a way, when we, we, kind of, we talk in these sort of stylized terms about... Um, non-attachment or dispassion and so on. But uh, it is really a, 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 a cultivated art whereby um, we're not like completely ignoring the movie, but we're not like, bedazzled or, or enchanted by, by the plot either. It's in a way, um, oftentimes I feel like it's sort of looking down at this you know, tragicomic um, uh, parade of, of human life, of you know what my mind does with certain situations and feelings, and the bo- how, how the, the the likes and dislikes of the body, the comforts and discomforts of the world and people and emotions, personalities, and so on. It's just this kind of the sense of, of looking down from above or looking sort of leaning against the back wall, kind of. With your feet up on the chair in front, thinking, <laughs> this is really strange. 
this whole kind of, uh, with a sort of ironic smile on our, our face of, of, that's, that's observing it, that's kind of looking down on this, this whole um, uh, kaleidoscope uh, of unfolding patterns of successes and failures and loves and hates and triumphs and crises and oceans of mediocrity. That, uh, that we uh, look upon as our lives and the sense of, uh, of detachment when we talk about detachment or dispassion it's really that, that sort of looking down with this, this loving half amused um, half weeping <laughs> uh, manner like looking down at the, the play of the five khandas doing their thing some of them called mine, some of them called the world, some of them called you. This, this, this kind of enchanting, tragicomic movie of our world. So when we, we get it right, when the, uh, also it was, I, it was a kind of bizarre sequence of thoughts that came across my mind. It was like, yeah, well, it is rather like, you know, like in, in the song, this is hugging with your baby in the last row of the balcony. So, well, yeah, the Buddha said, you know, f- uh, friendship, association with the, with the lovely, with the beloved, this is the whole of the holy life. So that, and he said, well, how, is, how does one form a friendship association um, with, the, uh, with the lovely? Is to practice the the uh, Eightfold Path. So in uh, this famous teaching that he gave about uh, spiritual friendship, when Ananda claimed that, made the claim that, that the half the spiritual life was, was Kalyanamita, spiritual friendship. And, and this is in the light of a discussion where he was... Um, Maintaining that, that meditation wasn't everything, but spiritual friendship was, was half of the holy life. And the Buddha corrected him, uh, not so, Ananda. It's not the half of the holy life, it's the whole of the holy life. So oftentimes that's taken as a, um, a kind of trumpet call, of, kind of hurrah for spiritual companionship, you know, my Buddhist group and my uh, fellow meditators and so on and so forth. My spiritual companions in terms of spiritual friends are as other humans. But as in many of his teachings, the Buddha doesn't just stop, doesn't just include one level, but he extends it. So that's the thing, spiritual friendship on the external level is the whole of the holy life. But on the internal level, he uses this, um, he, he draws this quality that actual spiritual friendship is he uses the word kalyanamita like um, in two senses. So on the one sense it's friend- friendship or friends who are spiritual. And on the other sense, the internal sense, it's, it's more, uh, it's flipped around. So it's friendship with the spiritual, or with the spirit, with the lovely, the kalyana, the beautiful. And then he says, and how does one establish that friendship, fellowship, companionship with the lovely, with a big L, with the beloved, is the Eightfold Path. This is how we cultivate the Eightfold Path, is what brings the heart into uh, association, companionship with, with the unconditioned, with the Dhamma, with that uh, ultimate truth of, 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 uh, of the way nature is, the way life is, the ultimate truth truth of, of, uh, of our nature and the nature of, of all things. So that, um, this is who we should be hugging with, <laughs> ultimately. Hug the Eightfold Path in the back of the balcony. And uh, this is how we can kind of observe the, the movie of our life, is that a, a kind of wholehearted commitment to that training sila, samadhi, panya, uh, virtue, concentration, 
mental training, a wisdom. Uh, it's obviously it's not you know, having that mapped out or just saying that as all of us, uh, even if we've spent, you know, even if you, this is the first contact you've ever had with Buddhism or meditation, at least you've had the last hour of having to be with you, know, sitting and being with your with your own mind. So all of us can see uh, that achieving that kind of fellowship with the lovely, that kind of um, attunement commitment of the heart to that truth, that unobstructed inner beauty, that fundamental beauty of Dhamma, of, of reality, is, is hard, is, is difficult. It's, it goes against the grain of, of, uh, of habit. We uh, have a massive uh, uh, current of conditioning a kind of an undertow of, of conditioning uh, uh, that is pulling us along like a like a, a current in the sea that, that even though the boat's not got a, got the motor going and there's no sails up you know it's being churned along at, at a rate of knots because of the the movement of the this current of of uh, the habits of a lifetime. So it, it uh, you know, so much of spiritual training and the and the, the uh, establishment of the heart in the in dhamma is about this going against the the current, pulling it, uh, or kind of resisting the habits of self concern, of greed, of fear, of hatred, of delusion, of working to um, to counteract that. To, to kind of, well, at least to, to know, hey, you know, I'm not, I haven't got the sails up, and there's no engine going. I'm not rowing, but yeah, we're really moving here. <laughs> and uh, do I do I really want to go in this direction? Uh, I just spent the last couple of weeks. Um, just staying up in uh, my kuti in the forest here. Each of us during the, this um, three-month rains retreat period during the summer uh, take it in turns for a couple of weeks at a time to to be on solitary uh, retreat in seclusion. And um, so I just had my uh, my uh, stint. Um, so, so that finished on the full moon yesterday and. Uh, one of the things that during that, that time that I found striking over and over was how um, yeah, how easy it is to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> this takes no effort at all. It's easier than falling off a log. That you just you know you just kind of the boat just kind of gets pulled along that way. And that um, and I was reminded of a of a um, a statement that Ajahn Sumato often makes, which is that. Whenever I think about myself, I get depressed. <laughs> this is the great master. This is our kind of, you know, the great white chief of, of our community, the sort of leading uh, Western disciple of Ajahn Chah, and um, uh, you know, extraordinarily accomplished uh, spiritual practitioner. And yeah, still freely with a big grin on his face. You know, whenever I think about myself, when I, when I think of myself, I get depressed. And it became really, well, the reason why I thought of that was because that was what was happening. <laughs> big surprise. And you see, it's like an incredibly like, simple equation that as soon as there's me, then there's this oppressed quality. And that everything is wrong. Well, at least not everything's wrong, but lots wrong. Like there's this out of orderness, there's this crampness of the heart, there's a sense of, of alienation, there's this kind, there's a fear basically, fear of somehow being wrong, that I've got it wrong, or I am wrong, or uh, I'm not worthy, or I'm not uh, trying hard enough, or I'm not loved, or I, I don't, I'm, I can't love, or I'm. I'm too lazy, or I'm too stupid, or I'm too obsessive, or and that these uh, 
I kind of when when I was, the more I would look at it, the more I would see that it just boiled down as to that that you know, it would take up some kind of individual pattern, some particular coloration, you know, whether I'm too busy or too lazy. <laughs> You know, it's sometimes blue, sometimes red, sometimes pink, sometimes black, sometimes white, sometimes yellow. But um, whatever, as soon as I am something, then that oppression, that cramping of of the heart would be there. That sense of wrongness, tension in the in the being, in the in the in the field of of experience. And uh, it really came to so so clear that you know in, intrinsic in that that just that feeling of I along with the sense of self it's it's very nature of that that the feeling of self even when it's sort of so subtle you can hardly even detect it it's like that the the kind of gratification of I the feeling of being that become that, that is there with the sense of I, its its partner is fear. That it's like the two sides of a coin. That you just you can't get one side of a coin. Like Ayton Shah would say, you know, when you when you when you hold up your hand, you have the front and the back of the hand. Well, you know, you pick up a, a clock. You got the front of the clock, the back of the clock. You can't just pick up the front of the clock. You know, or you can't when you pick up a coin. You pick up the heads and the tails. It's just that's the way it is. And even if you slice it down the center, you, know, <laughs> you still got you know the, the, you got the tails there, and you got the the uh, where the heads were, but there's still you got two sides. You, you you have to get both sides with it, and the intrinsic in that that feeling of of self, even if it's not even articulated as a I am or a me or a mine. Um, doesn't even get anywhere near the verbal realm, but just the, the, the gut feeling of of I-ness and meanness and minus. Then, right there in it is fear, because as soon as there's me, which is separate from the rest of the world and uh, in the rest of nature, then there's threat, because there's that which is not me. And as soon as that false barrier is created, then that is threatening. You know, it can be you know, alluring as well, but the, the most instinctual reaction is is threat. Like in in one of the, uh, uh, I mean, both biologically, that's the you know the, the case uh, that the the most rudimentary uh, nerve systems that we have are the pain receptors, that which is you know, keeping us away from danger. But also, it was interesting in the, one of the Upanishads begins with a, a passage that says uh, uh, something like, probably doesn't say exactly in the beginning, but or, uh, something along those lines. Like Originally, there was only the mind of the Absolute uh, at rest in the infinite void. And then in the mind of the Absolute, there arose the thought, I am. Mm-hmm. And as soon as there was a thought, I am, there arose fear. And on the arising of fear, there arose desire. Something to then, the desire for something to fend off the danger, to fill the gap, to, to, to provide the missing piece. So that is, is really intriguing, seeing how just the, 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 the most sort of subtle and coarse ways, grabbing different objects over and over again, they just seem that it's a basic relationship And maybe this is one of the way, reasons why we chose to call this monastery Fearless Mountain. <laughs> and the Buddha Rupa, in this, this gesture, the mudra of the right hand up, is like, is fearlessness, abhaya, no fear, free from fear. Because that, what well, you find, like in a way, if, we, if, if one uses that feeling of fear of, as the signal, that's the sort of the dukkha, Signal that tells you, you know, that oh, you know, some ignorance has has clouded the picture. Therefore, the feeling of I has arisen. Therefore, 
there's now fear, then that, if we take that as the signal to, uh, to respond, then we, uh, we, uh, we train the heart to, to let go of that. There's that um, recognition of that, that ignorance being there and that we don't have to abide in that. As long as we stay in that realm of like trying to make me right with the world. And, and obviously there's a whole massive array of psychologies that, that work on this basis, and, you know, some very usefully and effectively. But if it, if it stops there, it's just trying to make, you know, get the right relationship between me and the world. Like uh, one of our, our friends, uh, Tan Punadamo, says it's rather like rearranging the furniture on the, on the deck of the Titanic. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, you can do a certain amount of, you can make certain arrangements. <laughs> you can make it, you know, work better this way or that way, but fundamentally, you know, the ship is going down. So exactly where you put the furniture really doesn't matter that much. So maybe that's a bit of a rough analogy. <laughs> but it's something like that because we, and no matter how we try, how hard I try to make things right between me and you, as long as there's a solid me and a solid you, then it's, it's, it's fated, it's, it's blighted, it can't work because the very meanness and you is, 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 is fundamentally non, non-existent, is not, is not there, that's not the whole picture. So when we try and solve the, the, di- the dilemma or the discord in those terms, then we're always slightly missing the beat, or we're on the beat for a, a second and then it slipped off. It's, it's, it's kind of missed again. There's more dukkha. So, this is, um, in a way, we, we use this signal yeah, you know, uh, we we see that you know, how we we can, we have a huge array of strategies of getting away from that fear, that sense of threat, that that feeling of ego death. We have you know, vast varieties of of distractions and compulsions um, to get the attention away from that that horrible feeling of me under threat, me incomplete, me imperfect and you know you can just get drunk <laughs> you can go to the movies you can get you know really good movies you can have good you can have noble causes that you adhere to you can have you know, meditation techniques <laughs> you, know, you can um, fill a mind with useless information or useful information all kinds of things that we can do. You can hate someone, you can have unrequited loves, you can have requited loves. <laughs> we can uh, find you know, 10,000 different ways of, of getting the attention off that um, and you know, a huge amount of our, our life and our, sort of the economies of, of um, the, the world are, are built up around fending off that, that feeling. And you know, many things that are useful can come out of that. But really, when we're talking about spiritual practice at its most core level, what's, what's needed is to you know, understand what the process is. And it's just not just a matter of evading that, that death feeling, that ego death. It's not a matter of evading that threat or denying that threat, swamping it with, with life affirmation, but, but uh, understanding it. When uh, we, we look at the um, Buddhist scriptures and the, the, the Buddhist mythology, the, um, the, the Buddha's response to, to death, to Mara, you know, Mara is the embodiment of... of uh, unwholesomeness, the, the realm of, of desire and death. Mara literally means death. And is a sort of Satan figure of the, the Buddhist canon. You know, when the Buddha is, is assailed by Mara, when Mara tries to, to trick the Buddha or kind of seduce him into getting greedy or getting uh, self-deprecatory or uh, 
getting the Buddha into kind of evading his uh, his responsibilities and so on and so forth. The Buddha doesn't just shut his eyes and go into jhana and ignore Mara. He doesn't attack Mara with some kind of super duper transcendental thunderbolt and just blast Mara to smithereens. Uh, he doesn't go into negotiation and try to be reasonable <laughs> and discuss things with Mara on Mara's own terms or doesn't kind of try to justify himself. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> and Mara says, you know, you're, you're really wasting your time here. You know, you could go back and run a decent kingdom. I mean, now you're enlightened. You could run a kingdom. And you could do it totally skillfully. Never been done before. You could, be the, you could set a whole new theme, a whole new pattern. Righteous, righteous monarchy. You could yeah. be a great thing to do. How to lead a country completely skillfully. That would be a great thing. Why do you go and do that? So the Buddha doesn't justify himself. He doesn't attack Mara, doesn't blast him, doesn't ignore him. So the response to death is not just life affirmation. It's not just ignoring Mara and, and getting reborn in something else. It's not denial. It's not... It's not... Uh, Revulsion, but the the response that the Buddha makes, you know, over and over and over again, uh, throughout the, the scriptures, is this very clear, very cool, utterly unintimidated response, yeah, that comes straight from his heart, which is, "I know you, Mara. Oh, evil one, cousin of the negligent." You have come here for your own ends. <laughs> I know you, Mara. And then, uh, you know, of course, it, it is, it's, it's myth. It's not... Uh, one can kind of debate this as being you know, historically accurate or not, but it's a myth. And, and as such, it has its own meaning and power. But over and over again, as soon as the Buddha responds in that way, Mara knows that the Buddha's seen the trick. He knows there's a hook inside the bait. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to bite. Or he might eat the bait and leave the hook. (laughs) I know you, Mara. I know what this is. And then Mara is defeated in that, that gesture of knowing. This is a really important pattern for us, that the response to death is not, you know, or the opposite to death, or the, you know, the way that, that we meet that death feeling of loneliness, of failure, of laziness, of obsessiveness, of, of delusion, or weakness, or doubt, or you know, name your favorite flavor, you know, whatever our own disposition happens to be. It's not by being born into something else. The opposite of death is not, is not birth. It's not life affirmation. It's not trying to destroy death. It's through, through understanding. The response to death is wakefulness. I know you, Mara. It's waking up. So it's like a, a radical non-contention. Because as soon as we contend against death, then we've bought into the, the whole... Um, value system. We've we've bitten the hook. The hook is in. As soon as we we hate death, we fear death. We want to get away from death. We want to swamp it with, with with uh, with life. The hook is in. Mara, Mara's one. As the Buddha said, you know, if we've gone over to Mara's side, and the evil one can do with us as he likes. <laughs> Shouldn't laugh. <laughs> Been there. Often enough, it's a, it's a miserable place. You know, where the hook is in, and the the the, uh, the angler can can play with us as uh, as he chooses. We can run with the line as far as we like, but the hook is in. So this is the you know the the guidance for us, like 
to, to practice that radical non-contention. So non-contention just doesn't mean being passive or, or switching off. It doesn't mean denial. But there's, there's a full awareness, but a radical non-contention. Like the Buddha, as soon as the Buddha refuses to fight with Mara on his own terms, then Mara is defeated. He's known, but the Buddha is not going to pick up, pick up the weapon. So like another instant, instance where the Buddha is being heavily criticized and, and um, uh, people are um, uh, kind of speaking against him or um, misinterpreting his teaching and, and um, vilifying him. And he says, yeah, I do not contend with the world, the world contends with me. And uh, this is, uh, in a way, the most sort of radical and liberating attitude of heart that, that we need to establish, is that radical non-contention, that like not contending against the world around us, not contending against other people, not contending against you know, our thoughts, our feelings, our passions, our restlessness, our doubts. The whole, you know, all of the, the, the things that we don't want to be around or, or we feel are unwholesome or unskillful. You know, in terms of spiritual training, we often pick up these attributes of our life, our, the, the, the chattering mind, you know, the restless, restless mind, the habits of, of passion and fear, the habits of, of hatred and resentment and greed, righteous indignation our favorite villains, internal and external, that we've got absolute justification to be negative about. You know, it says in the book, you know, destroy greed, hatred, and delusion. <laughs> you know, or our, or our kind of unloved exes, or our uh, dark figures in our, our lives, the kind of wielders of, of, of painful influence in our world, political leaders that we love to hate, that we've got absolute justification, lists of criticisms of, completely backed up by names, dates, places, facts, <laughs> sheaves of them, yeah, all of that is just that the, the hook has sunk right in, and uh, We've taken up that, that attitude of contention. So it's a very subtle kind of practice, but it's, it's pertinent internally as well as externally. It's not just a matter of how we deal with our, the thought of our, of our ex-partner or our, our, uh, our mothers and fathers or, or our political leaders or our, the, our fear that our beloved is going to walk off or is looking at somebody else. Or you know, when, who's going to die first and get left behind? It's also equally relevant internally here, within our own minds. But that that quality of of meeting um, the the movie, the the internal movies with with wakefulness, not contending against, uh, uh, and we. We're not just blindly you know, letting the habits of the chattering mind run. We're not just letting greed and, and fear and anger go rampant. But this, it's really important to understand that non-contention just doesn't mean um, a passivity. There's a, an effort that we make. We work with uh, the negative uh, habits of mind, passions, thoughts, emotions, feelings. We work with them, but we're not contending against them. So it's not like the Buddha says, you know, okay, Mara, you know, it's all yours. Not at all. The point is to defeat Mara. But Mara is defeated, not through contending against Mara. It's difficult to understand. But as soon as we, we kind of take on Mara, you know, on Mara's own terms, we've lost. 
the heart is lost. It's kind of brought into the realm of birth and death. And then the mysterious thing is, is by this quality of wakefulness and the refusal to contend, that then that conquest happens. So what it means is that we are responding to the, or the working with the, the effort of training the heart to let go of, of the, the, the chattering mind, to, to steer the attention towards objects of concentration, to, to, to let go of um, anger and fear and greed, to cultivate and strengthen loving kindness, wisdom, compassion, that these efforts are being made, but they're, they're, the whole thing is embraced in this entire atmosphere and environment of, of non-grasping and non-contention. So that there's, um, whenever there's some thing there that we, we look upon as unwholesome or obstructive or unskillful, we don't allow that, the heart to, to sort of to drift into that creation of otherness, of creating it as something that needs to be pushed away or destroyed or wiped out. Well, this is tricky for us to do. But this is such a, a helpful principle to really imbue in the heart that how does this to investigate for ourselves, how does this thing work? Because when we think of non-contention, yeah, the habit will be to, to look at it in terms of passivity, just kind of lie back and ignore the movie. Can't, you know, have another cuddle. <laughs> ignore the movie altogether. Non-contention. Just let the whole thing roll over us. That's not it. It's a, a complete acceptance of the way things are. And in the same breath, in exactly the same gesture, making the effort to cultivate the wholesome, to sustain the wholesome, to restrain the unwholesome, to let go of the unwholesome that's arisen. That these efforts, the right efforts are being made, but not with a, a kind of dualistic attitude of mind. And that, we can only get the feel for that through direct experience. We can't, uh, we can't find how to do that unless we're actually kind of working with it for ourselves. Actually, we kind of jump in and, and, and swim for ourselves. We really explore that. But, uh, fine, how can we do that? How can we meet with the unwanted, the unloved, the unlovable, and not be swept along by it, not fighting against it, but to to know it and to to uh, to transcend it. Yeah, this is the, the task, at least as I see. I mean, there's there's dozens of different ways of expressing it, but this is really the task before us, and that. Just by taking a simple principle of non-contention, just using that as like as a flag, we can note, we can be aware of all of the habits of contention that arise within us. You know, as soon as the heart drifts into it shouldn't be this way, I'm you know, I'm all wrong, I how did I, how come I did that, or how can she how can she be that way, or he shouldn't be like that, or the world shouldn't be this way. Just like, oh, right, contention, look at that. And then using that, that flag to, to bring our attention to it, and then respond to that drift into contention with just waking up, just trusting. When the heart wakes up, when we invite the Buddha into the picture, when, when we, we energize the heart to to respond in that way of, I know this, I know you, Mara, I know what this is. Then, in that gesture of, I know you, Mara, seeing what comes about, seeing what arises from that, how that, how it transforms things. You know, the passion might still be there, but we understand it, we're not sucked into it. 
the motivation to cultivate is there, and we and we make the effort, but we're not identified with it. And we see for us, oh, that's how it works. This is the this is the manner. So, using that that uh, that quality of of uh, wakefulness and seeing for ourselves how that happens, how like in terms of the using the Buddha as the archetype what gesture the Buddha makes in the face of that or in that face of that waking up what happens does the Buddha stay still does, you know, does the Buddha move forward what happens in each moment what's the, the gesture of response and we see that it, does, it looks after itself and we just trust that awakened heart then we know oh do something act now or shut up <laughs> Go left. <laughs> Do not enter wrong way. Well, you could, but it's really going to hurt. <laughs> the heart knows. And then just over and over again, following that, trusting that. And then sometimes the world really screams at us and kind of demands our, our reaction. Mara is really yelling at us to buy in to the program, the bait is extraordinarily tasty and alluring and you know, compelling. And, uh, and yet, that there's this, you know, this absolutely perfect aplomb resolution that the Buddha has. This never picks it up, never buys into it. That's the, the, the symbolism, that's the, the example that the, the Buddha of the scriptures brings to us. It's outlining that dimension of our own being, which is uh, of that same kind of utter poise. Like uh, another of the, the s- stories of the scriptures where the Buddha is being harassed by a, a pompous Brahmin for, um, and criticized for being an alms mendicant and you know, disgracing his clan and, and uh, causing people to be deluded and, and, uh, and walking around the street ba- you know, as a uh, you know, homeless uh, beggars and a blight on society. And the Buddha asks the, the Brahmin, uh, and this is after the Brahmin's brother, who had exactly the same attitude, in typical sort of Theravada scriptural style. The first brother comes along and does this whole kind of diatribe against the Buddha, and the Buddha says a few words, and boom. You know, the first brother immediately says, oh, how could I be so stupid? <laughs> he becomes a disciple. So then the other brother is even angrier than the first one gets really upset and goes in and wades, in, uh, and wades into the Buddha. And then the Buddha asks him, well, if you have visitors who come to your house, do you, offer some, do you offer them some kind of refreshment or some sort of snack or some sort of um, meal of some sort? He says, well, yes, of course. The Buddha said, well, if, then if a person comes and they, they decline to, to receive what you offer, then... You know the the food that you were offering them. To whom does it belong? So it belongs to me, of course. And the Buddha says, "Well, in exactly the same way, you offer me your anger, but I don't accept it. Therefore, it belongs to you." So he's not. There might have been half a smile on his face. <laughs> I could easily imagine that. But he's not contending. But he's absolutely refusing to pick up this this red flag that the, the Brahmin is. Is, is waving in his face, demanding him to pick up the gauntlet. And the Buddha's like saying, no, it's your glove, mate. You threw it down, you pick it up. I don't, it's nothing to do with me. Your business. As soon as we, we miss that, and we, 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 we nibble the bait, and we get the hook in, then we find ourselves over and over again, just... You know, the, the, our very efforts to to train ourselves to cultivate spiritual life is you know is actually taking us in the opposite direction. It's, it's really it's sort of tragic. It's part of the, you know the tragedy part of the tragedy comic is how you know we in the, in our efforts to create good we we create harm for ourselves. Like uh, Ajahn Mun's Ballad of Liberation from the Five Khandas is, is full of references to this, that um, 
it's a, a great obstacle to the practice, this, you know, this uh, clinging to good and constant fear of bad. So you know, over and over again in different ways he, he kind of emphasizes that. You know, wanting the good, rejecting the bad, this uh, you know, only further entangles the heart. Or in the, the verse of the third Zen patriarch, when we try to stop activity to achieve passivity, our very efforts fill us with activity. Now this is the, the, tra- the tragedy of, of the religious world, is that we, we have all these structures and that make all this noble effort, and you know, we have you know, customs and traditions and the forms and rules and incredible noble aspiration for you know, all of us, lay community, monastics alike. Incredible efforts we put in doing retreats and keeping precepts and, and serving and, and helping and cultivating unselfishness. But you know, if, we, if we pick it up in the, in the wrong way, then the, the, the very effort that we make, our kind of very religiosity becomes an obstruction to the, 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 the effort that we're making, our very eagerness to destroy the, 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 the wrong in our mind, the, the kind of unruly thoughts and the ugly passions and the uh, anxious fears and wiping out doubt and, and hatred, it, it, it only compounds the whole mess. I think all of us have had kind of painful experiences of this. When we want to destroy evil, the very effort you know, to destroy creates more of the same pain and, and darkness. There's a, a great um, s- story uh, of Dostoevsky's. It's one of the chapters of the brothers Karamazov called uh, it's a story that one of the brothers has written and it's called The Grand Inquisitor. Probably a few of you are familiar with this. And The, the, the plot, in short, is that it's set in, the t- in Spain in the time of the Spanish Inquisition and Torquemada the head of the Inquisition is a sort of very grave, tall, uh, gaunt, 90-year-old monk. And he's uh, just come from some kind of uh, gr- you know, nasty examination of some <laughs> variety of miscreants in the court of the Star Chamber, extracting the truth from the unbelievers. And he's walking across the, the plaza in the, the, in the city, and there's this whole on one side of the plaza and there's this commotion going on by the steps of the cathedral and uh, he sends one of the, the monks who's with him over to go and find out what all this, this hoo-ha is, is about and they go scuttling over and then they, they come by and he, after a while he says Venerable Sir, Venerable Sir you'll never believe this, this is incredible but, but the Messiah has returned he's just raised a, a little girl from the dead on the steps of the cathedral he's come back, he's come back it's him, it's really him and then, uh, then Dostoevsky describes Torquemada kind of straightening his spine, kind of looking over across the, across the courtyard, and this is a we- the, the thoughts move and turn in his mind, trying to decide what to do. And eventually he, he, he kind of takes a breath and says, Seize him. <laughs> And they arrest Jesus. <laughs> and then there's this extraordinary dialogue between Torquemada and Jesus in the prison, where he's, Torquemada is trying to explain to him that this is really not the best time to come back. <laughs> and that he's going to really screw things up, because they've got a really good thing going now. And there have been a lot of troubles in the church, and they're just getting it all cleaned out. <laughs> and if he comes along and does this whole kind of miracle thing, and uh, the second coming, this is, it's going to just throw the whole... Plan, you know, the, the whole well-formed development plan completely out of whack. And so he's sorry, he really regrets it very deeply, but I can't release you. It's well worth a, a read if, uh, if you've never seen it. But it's, it's, it's a real heartbreaker. But it, it maps out, you know, this is what happens. You, you get so obsessed with purifying our mind, trying to make me pure, trying to make me harmonized with, with the world. We try so hard at, at making it all right, loving good, fearing and hating bad, that we end up 
uh, imprisoning the Messiah. <laughs> Very reasonably, I'm sorry, but you know, you're an evil thought and I've got to wipe you out. <laughs> you know, but we, we end up obstructing and, and, and suppressing kind of uh, the very thing that we're trying to do through the you know talking about I thought he was doing the right thing that's the that's the painful irony is that we we're we're good in there's good intention and a faithfulness to a system plugging away but then that very um, sense of self that has been invested in that that very imputation of solidity that very contention against the bad or the wrong or that which shouldn't be is actually feeding that alienation and the amazing thing is that even though that sounds pretty dense that and, and, and it's obviously you know, it's a, a familiar bitterness to all of us it's totally curable this is one of the most wonderful, marvelous, amazing things about Buddha Dharma. Is it's, it's, uh, we, we cannot get so lost that it's irre, irremediable, unremediable, irremediable, irre, irre, irremediable. <laughs> this is the day after the all night sitting. <laughs> one of those words. <laughs> it can be fixed, it's fixable. If you think about it again, talking about Mara. You would have thought, if you'd been Satan 37 times, you would have racked up a pretty hefty pile of bad karma, right? 37 lifetimes, and long lifetimes, obviously. You know, Mara has a, kind of a decent lifespan. 37 lengthy lifespans of being Satan. It's a heck of a, a pile of bad karma. You think, you know, you'd never get out of that. The Buddha's second disciple, Mahamogalana, at least according to the mythology, was Mara 37 times. That's pretty, pretty amazing. He's, he's not only an enlightened disciple, but the Buddha's second disciple, like, you know, right at the top of the heap. 37 times Mara. And even you think, well, yeah, that's just fairy stories. But still, even the symbol of it, I find immensely powerful. That not only is that workable, but it's, it's you know, that it's you know, so workable to, to the point that you can end up as one of the great disciples of the Buddha and totally helpful and, you know, and benevolent, radiant presence in the universe, helping to, to, you know, to liberate so many other beings. So, you know, we might think that my mind, with its kind of disgusting aversions and its gripes and its fears and its insecurities and its horrible doubts and its seething unspeakable passions it lusts that we hardly dare think about and talk about if we compare like, our little collection of nastinesses against being Mara 37, for 37 lifetimes you think well I've been at least 38 I'm sure I'm, you know, I'm so good. <laughs> but let's put that aside for the moment but just that, you know, we can, if we measure it, just the kind of um, degree of unskillfulness that we've followed in our lifetimes and the incredibly stupid things that we've all done, just using that simple example of, of, um, of Mahamogalana, we see, yeah, it's, it's, it's workable. Nothing is unfixable. All it takes is that gesture of waking up, that gesture of, I know what this is, I know you, Mara, to respond to that kind of, the death clamp uh, of, uh, on the heart of, I know what this is, I know you, Mara. The responding to that the ego death by wakefulness, by, by knowing. Then, in that very moment, the heart is freed. That's what, all it takes. That's the gesture of the Buddha. Well, like t- today we did the Angulimala protection, the, which is a, a, a protective verse, a parita, that's done for expectant mothers. And you think, you know, well, there's some sort of special protective verse for, for, uh, for mothers and their, and their 
babies to be born. You know, oh, how sweet, how kind, how gentle, what a beautiful, uh, utterly sensitive, kindly you know, gesture in the universe. But you might notice that it's the Angulimala protection. Angulimala was a mass murderer. Again, according to the, the, the stories in, in the time of the Buddha, he killed 999 people. He was a, a, a bandit chief. And he was on the way to, to kill his mother, uh, who happened to be the, the, the thousandth victim to be, just happened to be his mother. We thought, well, okay, I've, got to, you know, I've got to make my thousand today. And then uh, the Buddha intervened. And Angulimala became uh, one of the Buddha's disciples in an arahant. You know, after having killed hundreds of people. And he used to, Angulimala means garland of fingers. He used to cut their fingers off and wear them as a garland around his neck. Pretty gory kind of a guy. So not, not only did he become an arahant, but then, I find this a very, very lovely, beautiful kind of twist of the tale. But one day on his arms round, he was walking through the town and he saw this woman trying to give birth to a child and she had been in labor for many, many hours and it was in terrible agony. And the, the child was unable to be born. And it was this incredible, painful scene that he saw and his heart was really broken by this. And so when he got back to the monastery, he, he told the Buddha what he'd seen and the Buddha said, well, go back to that woman and say to her, uh, since the time that I've been born, I've never knowingly hurt, I've never knowingly taken the life of another living creature. By the power of the, by the truth of this statement, may you and your child be free from suffering. And uh, and then Angulimala said, "But, but <coughs> venerable sir, you know, in, indeed, uh, this is wouldn't this not be an untruth? Because I've taken the life of many living creatures." And the Buddha said, "Well, then say from the time I was born in the noble birth." Arya Jati, the noble birth. I've never knowingly taken the life of another living creature. By the power of this truth, may you and your child be at ease. And so he went back to the town and he recited this verse to the woman and she gave birth to her child you know, easily and, and with no further problems. And so from that time, this verse has been recited as a protective paritta for expectant mothers. And so it's a wonderful thing. I find it beautiful um, irony that um, the mass murderer uh, has uh, his nature has, uh, has so changed, or that that uh, the recognition of that fundamental purity of that being's nature has sort of emerged as a as a complete flip side from the destroyer of people to the protector of babies. But that, that kind of um, redemption, that turnaround, that uh, quality is, is uh, embedded there within, the, uh, within that principle. And so that his name is synonymous with, with uh, the protection of the, the utterly helpless and, and uh, vulnerable. And uh, two and a half thousand years later, there's, that's uh, you know, still the spirit in which his, his name is invoked. So there's hope for all of us, <laughs> in short. So I'll leave that there for this evening.